we're going to be discussing the common weeds of the Yarra Ranges. Um, obviously, that list could be extensive, as for all regions of um, all regions of the world, really. Um, so um, I had to sort of narrow it down, but I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of things that I that I haven't covered. And if people have got specific questions um, or specific problems they want sort of uh, answers to or advice on, I'm more than happy to help and obviously feed those questions um, through Jen. So I suppose today um, I'm a little bit about myself. I've been, I run a business based in the Dandenong Ranges. So I live in the Dandenong Ranges. Um, our, uh, as a bushland management uh, contractor, we work from probably the, the, the eastern, sort of southeastern belt of Melbourne. So uh, kind of from Warrandyte uh, down through the Dandenong Ranges um, and surrounds and foothills, um, which is kind of a heartland. And then down to the uh, northern Mornington Peninsula and the northern Western Port region, which sees us get into coastal salt marsh and um, some of the woodlands and heathlands on the Northern Islands of um, Western Port. Uh, so get an opportunity to deal with a vast array of different weed species. Um, and with that in mind, the program for today will be to look, you know, sort of describe what a weed is, um, characteristics of a weed, look at um, vegetation in terms of both structure and form, look at the kind of tools that we use when we're out in the field, um, uh, look at some of the difficulties with tackling weeds in terms of the immensity of the task. Um, uh, sort of further look at the philosophy around weeds and then look at some weed species and then from there take, um, uh, take questions. That's a lot to unpack in a very short period of time and I can chew the ears off anybody. So I guess I better get moving. Um, with that in mind, I guess we look at what a, what a weed is um, and a lot of you, may already be familiar with these things. So I'll um, uh, try, try not to spe spend too much time on them. But I guess ultimately a weed is a plant that is, weed consider is in the wrong place. Um, now that could be um, in the garden, in a bushland setting, in an agricultural setting. Um, often a plant that is considered a weed in one aspect or one setting is considered desirable in another. And I guess I, sort of looked at something like um, bracken or austral bracken, where it can be quite problematic in farming and agricultural settings, but is a very important colonizer and structurally important plant for habitat in many bushland and natural settings. Uh, it's also important to understand that, interestingly, when we're doing our work, many of the most invasive and difficult to tackle weeds are often uh, Australian native plants that are growing out of their range or being become naturalised in, in other settings in the Melbourne region. So when I'm talking about those, obviously one that we see a lot of, particularly in the Dandenongs and, and beyond, is Sweet Potosporum, which is native to East Gippsland, areas of South Gippsland. Um, the Sallow Waddle, which is also sort of native to the eastern sort of seaboard of uh, Australia and bluebell creeper or Western Australian creeper, which is uh, in the same uh, genus of plants as uh, appleberries that we get, uh, the common appleberry, purple appleberry that we get in Victoria, um, but is a very vigorous climber, particularly bad on sort of the sandy and granitic soils. So with that in mind, I guess with a lot of the weeds, um, what are the characteristics of a lot of these weed species? Well, I guess ultimately they're opportunistic, uh, they're vigorous growers, um, they're prolific seeders, uh, they're very good at excluding and outcompeting desirable veg vegetation. Uh, some plants have things, uh, what are called all allelopathic qualities, whereby they even exude chemicals, which um, sort of uh, promotes conditions for their own regeneration, excluding others. Um, and they can often form dense monocultures. So they're very key characteristics of what we often consider um, to be a weed. Now with that in mind, um, it can be very difficult at times when looking at weeds um, 
in a modified landscape to um, uh, to assess both structure and form of those weeds. So given that we live in a highly modif modified landscape, it's um, it's important to consider that weeds themselves or what we consider weeds can actually be habitat to a vast array of native fauna species. Um, so often when you're looking at tackling these uh, particular weeds on your property or in you know, a local reserve, um, if you're part of a friends group or land care, looking at the structure of the vegetation around you, as well as the form, as in the type of species that are around is also really, really important. So for example, um, I guess um, often what is considered public enemy number one in blackberry. Blackberry is often, uh, blackberry thickets are often used by birds like superb fairy wrens for habitat and nesting. Um, bandicoots also, uh, particularly in areas like uh, East Gippsland examples where um, bandicoots are only found in the, in the thickets of blackberry along some of the rivers and watercourses in East Gippsland. So it provides protection for them. Uh, Eastern spinebills, uh, a beautiful, beautiful local native bird, absolutely love red cestrum. Um, so if you're removing big areas of red cestrum, you've got to be mindful of doing it um, over a staged period of time, it's a staged process. So therefore you're not removing all the, the highly modified, but still removing the habitat of some of these um, uh, native fauna species. Um, the flip side to that is obviously that uh, these same species, for example, blackberry, can also provide significant harbour and habitat for pests. That is pest animal species being uh, rabbits and foxes. So it's quite complex when you're considering how and why to remove certain types of weeds at certain periods of time. Um, and all of these things can be happening on a local level. So if it's at your own back garden, uh, whether you've got a small block of a quarter acre, um, if you're on a rural property, if you're adjoining a national park, um, whether you're working in a bushland setting, in a forest setting, in a small reserve. So all of these things are things that we consider when we're, when we're working in the field. With the, with, from a garden perspective, um, a lot of the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely include myself in, uh, in this sort of uh, under this umbrella. Is um, it can be a pretty overwhelming and daunting task. We're all time poor. We're all working. Um, yes, I can be the plumber with the dodgy toilet or the mechanic with the car that uh, you know doesn't start in the morning. So um, we're all in it together. Um, we often in, inherit problems in our yards that we didn't create. A lot of the problems that we're faced with from a weed perspective have, have taken a long time to get to that stage. So it's important to realize that when you are tackling weed issues, uh, that you don't take on more than you can follow up. Start with some easy wins and, and work out from those areas. Um, work from the good areas of your garden out, work from the good areas of a, a reserve you might be involved in out, and then stabilize that area, get that in, in reasonable condition, and which then allows you to move out from that position, uh, whether as again, whether it be a garden or a natural setting. Um, and I think early on, what can be important is to consider management as opposed to eradication. Um, once you flick into the headspace of management over eradication, things can become a little bit more enjoyable and a little bit less daunting. Because a lot of these things have been here for a long period of time. A lot of the weeds that we're trying to tackle, um, they've taken a long time to get into a certain state. They can take a long time to, to recover, um, uh, pull back into a, into a, I suppose, a structure, that uh, a desirable structure that we're looking for. So, we're in for the long game. Um, um, once you jump in, um, you're in for good. I don't think there's any situation that I've ever worked in where um, you can walk away um, from a particular site or a particular job and say that that is done. We are actually there for the long haul and we're all part of the ongoing management and survival of that particular 
uh, garden, that particular bushland setting that we're working in. Um, so yeah, eradication of many weeds can be very, very difficult. Um, this can also happen, be, be difficult to deal with based on things like edge effect. So for example, you might have your garden under control for a particular weed. Let's say angled onion, we're adjoining properties. You've got dense infestations. They keep seeding it into your property. They keep pushing in. Um, I myself have those similar issues with plants like sycamore maple down the bottom of my property, which are uh, over the years I've got got rid of the sycamore maple on my block, which is about half an acre in the Dandenongs, southern end of the Dandenongs, um, but they're continually seeding in. Um, one year with seedlings, I made the mistake of, um, well, actually it wasn't a mistake, I was getting sick of pulling them out. So I offered the kids um, a reward. Well, kids a reward to see how many sycamore maple, maples they could pull out. I said, okay, kids, here we go. You got um, 10 cents of sycamore maple. Off you go, see how many pull out. Let's how much pocket, let's see how much pocket money you can, you can earn. Little did I know 10 minutes later that both of them looking at their buckets had probably earned themselves about 50 bucks in 10 minutes. So I had to renegotiate that deal. Um, they weren't happy with $5, but I learned pretty, pretty quickly that $10 a sycamore maple seedling is, oh, it's way too high a rate. Try try one or two cents and um, see how you go with that. Um, so yeah, but the kids did earn some money that year, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, so that's um, important to consider. And one thing my grandpa, my grandpa was a great gardener and I learned a lot with him. I grew up in England, don't hold that against me, um, but he was a fabulous gardener. Um, still a time where it has beautiful hedgerows and hedgehogs in the back garden, um, bird boxes, awesome veggie patch. And his whole philosophy, which is something I've tried to take with me, I think through life is a little bit and often. Um, so just doing that little bit and just staying in touch with things, being out there as much as you can. It doesn't always have to be, you know, an entire Sunday afternoon. Cause I, you know, we're all time poor. We've got kids doing sport. Um, we've got inclement weather, we've got lockdown. We've got lots of different things that impact our ability um, to get, in, get into the yard or get into the reserves that we're working in. So I think frequency is really important. Doing a little bit and often, even ensuring when you are removing weeds, look at um, the capacity to actually revegetate. So uh, looking at, you know, locally indigenous species, which are available from a whole range of local nurseries. So as you remove put back in, take a little bit, put a little bit back in and then look after those areas. Um, all really, really, um, excuse me, important uh, attributes of, I suppose, not losing heart and feeling disheartened about the process that's involved with some of these weed issues, because some of them are really, really significant. There's no doubt about it. Um, some of the private properties, certainly around the hills and the Yarra, uh, Yarra Ranges in general and well beyond have significant weed issues and they can be very, very daunting. Um, I think it's also important to look at weeds in the perspective of, in reality, a weed species is a symptom and not a cause. So, Weeds often are there because of a certain set of conditions that are allowing them to, uh, uh, to thrive. Um, favorable conditions, which might be highly disturbed or modified landscapes, um, high nutrient load. So, you know, for example, in the hills, lots of people still on septic tanks. Um, um, stormwater runoff, um, which is ca carrying uh, nutrient from and pollutants like hyd hydrocarbons from roads, um, just the velocity of the water. That water itself causes erosion, exposes soil. Um, stormwater runoff carries um, uh, seed from plants outside of uh, your area. I mean, I get home from work sometimes, shake out my socks, and then I'll go down the back garden uh, two months later and I go, where did where did all that panic velt grass come from? And I realized that it's probably just come from my socks. I also had friends who planted their socks because they had so much of the native bidgey widgey stuck to their socks. I just slapped them in the back garden and hey presto, they had a nice big, big patch of bidgey widgey, which is uh, not such a bad thing, by the way. So um, love that plant. Yeah, great ground cover. So they're all things to, um, uh, to consider. Uh, what we'll look at now, I suppose, We've talked about structure and form and 
I suppose have a little look at some of the tools that we use on our uh, in our day to day work. Um, the tool belt of a bush regenerator. Um, these tools are really easy to come by. There's obviously a vast array of things that um, you can use, uh, but there's some really really simple hand tools that can go a long way to helping you deal with. Um, the problems that you may have in the yard. So bear me a second. I'll see if I can pop the camera down. I've got a little bit of show and tell. Um, I'll start with the typical typical sort of bush regen tool belt. Um, here we go here. So, excuse me, guys. Hopefully everything's working okay with the hotspot as well because I had some issues this morning online. So these are the belts that we wear when we're at work. Um, you can get a pouch like this from any, any, any of the obviously at leading hardware stores or tool shops like Tony Tool. Um, with this little belt, um, we can pretty much do anything and everything that we desire. My notes are flying everywhere. That's what you get to do in the outside. Everything and everything we desire, well, 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 most of everything and anything, obviously we're not gonna be chainsawing down trees, but we've got a pick. Um, this is called a Macca tool. Fantastic pick, unfortunately. This was an Australian design, but they don't make this anymore. Um, a man out of Sydney, out of the Hunter Valley, and I got put onto these by um, um, Vicky Boyle, who is the president of Southern Dandenong's Land Care Group. And Vicky's living up in New South Wales, I believe now. Did lots of amazing work in the hills. So there we've got a Macca tool. Um, small hand weeding trowels. Um, these are fantastic. These are actually... Um, a tool I came across in Sydney, but I mean, a uh, company in Sydney, a forge in Sydney makes them uh, through, and I buy them through a company called Forestry Tools. So you can get on their website online. They do a whole heap of really, really good bush regen and gardening tools, but you can get something from any of the hardware stores, any, any trail that you've got, perfectly fine. Um, hand weeding knives. Yep, that's right. These things are absolute little beauties. Um, fantastic for just, uh, prizing out small weeds in the garden. You can use them on exotic grasses, thistles, pretty much anything you want. They're sharp. Um, they get blunt quite quick because of the soil and rocks. Um, basically a vegetable knife. Um, I got this one from, or I buy these from E. Muir's down in Mombolk, but you can get something similar. Some people even use just a really big, strong butter knife. Uh, they're really good as well. Um, pruning saw. Uh, sometimes we use quite large pruning saws depending on what we're doing, but when we're being really mobile in the bush, um, we'll often use uh, like a folding saw like this. Um, this one's by a brand called Gomboy, but there's a whole heap of different varieties out there. Again, uh, you can get them from a you know, huge range of uh, outlets, hardware stores, etc. cetera. Um, great shop in... Bayswater that sells these, Arbor Master, um, this particular brand. And again, there's some really good online shops that um, that stock these sort of tools. Uh, and probably something you'll never want to be without is a, is a good pair of secretaires. Uh, again, available from all leading retailers. Uh, uh, people might disagree with me, but Falcos are the best. You'll find it pretty hard to break these. Everything about them is replaceable. Um, they do cost a little bit. And, and I think that's something that's important to, um, uh, to acknowledge. Whenever you're buying tools, buy good stuff. Um, it'll last longer, it's repairable. You can get replacement parts. It's nothing worse than going in the yard with a dodgy pair of secretaires that cross up and the spring goes and the handle snaps. Um, you know, you can spend good money on a pair of secretaires, 70, 80 dollars. $100 sounds like a lot, but they'll last you a lifetime. So always highly recommend um, good quality tools. Uh, some other tools that we've um, used in the field. Um, these are that are, again, little, um, little garden forks, fantastic. A little cultivator. Um, these can be used to scratch out um, little small herbaceous weeds. Weeds in the veggie patch, fantastic in the veggie patch, actually. That's hopefully what I'll be doing later today. Um, then you get on to some um, tools which we use when we're treating woody weeds. So uh, cordless drill, uh, something that we use readily when we're drilling and filling larger woody weed species in the field. 
Um, that's got a 10 mil drill bit on it. Um, and um, yeah, any any sort of, uh, any regular cordless drill is perfect for the job. I've got some photos of um, drill and fill techniques that I'll be able to show you later. But um, again, sort of keeping them clean and dry, keeping your drill bit sharp. We use a drill bit called a Brad Point bit. So this is a 10 mil bit, it's used for woodworking. They're a little hard to get, but you can see, you can see on the drill bit, it's got a little point. So that does help if you're sort of drilling into the, I don't know, obviously not drilling in something like that, but if you're drilling into some timber, it allows it to sort of grip on and then you get an accurate sort of accurate hole in the, in the tree. Um, no one would have heard one of these in the last few weeks, would they? Yes, a chainsaw. Obviously been going like crazy with storm damage. Um, good old fashioned brush cutters. Um, this one's a beauty. Uh, this is still 240. But then these things do go all day. You don't have to have the biggest and the best in that regard. Um, but again, with your power tool. Power tools. Um, Quite good quality, they'll last, they're repairable. Uh, it's, um, they're more enjoyable to use. Uh, uh, you'll get further in a, you know, in a shorter period of time. Um, yeah, so I think the quality over quantity with your tools is a really important thing. Um, on that, I guess I better get going with some weed species because I knew this would happen and I'd run out of time. So made a little bit of a list of some, key weed species that we deal with um, in the bush, also that I've dealt with in my garden and that many of us deal with in our garden settings. Um, this is very, very far from exhaustive. Obviously we could spend uh, a year of Sundays going through the different weed species that we encounter. And I'm sure I'm sure there'll be some questions on, on uh, different weeds, which I'm more than happy to answer. And hopefully I've got the answers I would Hate to suggest that I've got all the answers, but um, let's start to have a little look at some weed species. And I went for a little walk this morning and um, tried to collect some samples. So I thought rather than looking at photos, let's look at some samples, a bit more tactile. Um, so while you're rugged up, having a cuppa, uh, hopefully, you know, it's a little bit easier to see the characteristics of the plant. Um, now, one plant which is really, uh, bear me one second, let me just open which is um, really prevalent at the moment. Um, I'm sure we're familiar with this, because it stinks. I've got a good example of it. Is good old angled onion. So it's coming into flower at the moment. Um, this particular weed loves damp, wet, moist, boggy, high nutrient load areas. Um, it dies back to a bulb, so uh, over, it uh, lies dormant in the warmer summer months. It's come. It's really in its peak sort of phase at the moment. Um, starts as a bulb, a uh, big fat bulb, uh, uh, really quite swollen, thins out, ends up looking like a spring onion. Um, and then you can see here multiple different bulbs on the plant. If I can, you can see what's, this is probably originally one bulb that's just kept dividing. So there's a little baby one that's probably from last last season or season before. More little baby ones there, just constantly splitting off. So what happens is the bulbs swell and then they divide. So you can see at the moment there's a there's a little bulb. Now that will swell, and from that bulb, that bulb will then divide and create at least one other bulb, um, often several. So that little clump of angled onion probably started, I'll see if I can find one that's got a, yeah, yeah, that one might be doing it. Um, that's missing hands. You can probably see there, it's really hard to see, sorry. That was actually a separate bulb there that was going to grow, but it's not quite there. So that will swell, that item will swell, another bulb will form and they will split and divide and they increase their density and cover that way. The other way angled onion um, uh, spreads is through seed. So not only can it uh, spread through their bulbs, but it also spreads through producing seeds. So the ovary is in there. When it's been pollinated and fertilized, that ovary will swell. 
You can see there, there's a little capsule. That little capsule there is absolutely chockers full of seeds. Um, that when they become ripe, they'll obviously hit the ground and you've got uh, many, many multiples of angled onion on top of that. They get washed down through stormwater drains, um, moved around by ants, uh, very problematic. So a weed like angled onion, if left the flower and the bulbs to divide every year, can really, really take over and colonize areas. Now, in terms of control of angled onion, you can definitely hand weed it. Um, uh, in bushland settings, in really dire situations that you can use herbicide application. Um, so that's knapsack spraying, for example. Um, but one other technique that is often used, and it's a long-term technique, but you can consider also just slashing it at the right time before it forms seed set. And you can get a thing called bulb exhaustion, uh, whereby over time the bulbs give up and the angled onion will start to thin out. Now that might take quite a long period of time, but um, it is possible and it is a technique which was widely used and certainly probably seen it become more prolific on roadsides um, to a degree because there is a lesser slashing regime. So usually often roadsides are often slashed from a fire perspective, um, um, not so much so from controlling a an environmental weed such as angled onion. Interestingly, angled onion is also edible. So it is three-cornered garlic. That's one of its other names. Um, not that I'd go eating it out of all locations. Some not so, um, yeah, I don't know what it's growing in. So I, I might skip on that one. Um, from the Mediterranean. So weed number one. Um, weed number two, and I tried to grab examples that showed some flowering material. Um, certainly, yeah, been one of the big public enemy number one plants in the Dandenongs over the years is English ivy or heterohelix. This plant's from Europe, grows over vast areas of Europe. Um, now, this can obviously form really, really dense uh, uh, monoculture ground covers, outcompetes all sorts of different types of vegetation. Um, uh, in the forest, it uh, can be a real big issue for native animals. For example, uh, lyrebirds find it really difficult to scratch through in, um, dense ground story of English ivy. Um, English ivy also as I'm sure we've all seen, grows up trees and shrubs and ferns, um, smothers those particular plants. Now with a tree, for example, a dense infestation of English ivy up a tree uh, doesn't allow that particular tree to shed its bark. It creates a microclimate around that tree, which might in increase fungi, uh, fungal attack, insect and borer attack, can weaken the tree and in many instances, can actually kill the tree. Um, another important factor to consider with English ivy is also that it only fruits, or should I say, it generally only fruits, I'd probably say at least 90% of the time, 99% of the time, it only fruits and sets seed when it's actually growing vertically. So this was taken off um, a tree stump down the back uh, in the property below my, uh, below my place. Um, it's growing, it's got some immature fruit on it, which is green, that will turn back. Uh, birds like currawongs will eat that, um, obviously then dispersing it through their droppings and then um, obviously spreading it to new areas. So treating English ivy, which is growing vertically, is really, really um, important for the health of the tree um, that it's growing up or the health of the fern or, or any type of desirable vegetation, and also to try and ensure that it stops seed set. And I think that's really important to note with many of these weed species when you're initially starting to tackle them, that trying to reduce seed set is, is a really, really good early technique. So if you can get to something before it sets seed, even if it's brush cutting it, ha uh, hand weeding it out, fantastic result. But stopping that seed set at least is stopping it, um, dropping seed back into the seed bank and causing problems. So that's English ivy. Um, you can just rip that out and go crazy. There are chemical control methods with um, with knapsack spraying or rig spraying in, in really dense infestations. But a lot of this you can do by hand. I've got some photos of even in my yard that I'll show you later um, where I've done a lot of work by, uh, by hand and some friends have helped me as well. Um, on English ivy and we've done 
countless hours of work on this in the field. So there's English ivy. Um, what have we got now? Okay. So here we've got sweet potosporum. Um, sweet potosporum, again, I've tried to get plants that are fruiting. So you can see what you're doing here. Woody weed species, um, had a lot of focus over the years, native to East Gippsland. You can hand pull small plants. You can cut and paint um, smaller plants. So that is using either your printing saw and your, um, uh, and your secateurs. I'll show you a dabber bottle in a second. Um, you can drill and fill, you can do chainsaw work. Um, there is a technique called ring barking, which doesn't work too well on, um, it's a non-chemical method. Doesn't work too well on sweet potosporum because they will reshoot from the base, even if they're ring barked or even if they're cut and don't have herbicide application. Um, and again, seeds prolifically, smells wonderful, beautiful plant, um, can also be an important habitat tree uh, in very disturbed or highly modified areas. So for example, um, there are sites we work on where you'll often see uh, powerful owl using um, sweet potosporum's roost trees, um, ringtail possums are up in the sweet potosporum. So you've got to be careful um, about clear felling or just, uh, you know, sort of decking all of the sweet potosporum Prosperum in particular location because there are are going to be things that are using it. After all, it is it's only it's only it is a native only a couple of hundred kilometres down the road um, from many Yarra Ranges locations. Again, what we try and do when we're treating this in the bush and something to think about in your garden is try and eliminate the fruiting plants. Um, so the plant the female plants that are going to set fruit and seed. If you target those first, and then you're left with a um, Leave the, leave the male plants, which are not going to set seed um, and produce fruit. Well, I mean, that's quite complex because uh, apparently sweet potosporum can change, um, change sex or males can uh, produce seed. Yeah, that's a, that's a workshop in itself. Um, yeah, that's a really good start. So start with the seeding and fruiting plants, remove those first. Um, same deal with this guy. Um, English holly or holly, um, again, native to Europe, can be an important habitat tree in highly modified areas as well. Extremely pr pr prickly customer. Um, it does layer. Um, so you'll find that it's got little runners and layers growing out from the main plant, particularly if it's been disturbed. We want to try and target the plants that are fruiting and seeding. So the ones with the red berries on there, the ones that we want to try and remove first, because they're the ones that the birds are going to eat and the possum is going to eat, and they're the ones that are going to spread. So that's what I'd be targeting first off. Again, uh, hand pulling small plants, cutting and painting um, la uh, slightly larger plants, drilling and filling chainsaw work, and um, uh, so cut and paint applications applications on larger scale can be done with holly. Holly will regrow from small fragments if left on the ground. In fact, a lot of plants will do that. Um, so you have to be careful not to, to either elevate it, not leave it on uh, damp, wet, moist ground or stack things on top of it because it will grow back. Um, seen examples of trees that have been treated or maybe not treated properly where lower limbs have dropped back down to the ground with the main tree dead and those lower limbs when they've touched the ground have actually reshot and continued to grow so tough customer can take a long time to treat large infestations of holly ask the friends of Sherbrooke Forest they'll tell you about that one um, something I don't see so much of around my area but broom species so here we've got uh, Montpellier broom. These are in the pea family. Um, they're really quite pretty. Um, they can form unbelievably dense infestations. Can be a bit of a problem from a fire perspective. So obviously creating a lot of fuel load um, can uh, complete, uh, really get into bushland settings and in drier sites cause some real issues, um, creating large stands, long, large monocultures. Um, so they've got a yellow pea flower, which is just coming into sort of flower now. Little seed pods, sort of similar to what you see on some of the, some of the acacias or the wattles. This is Montpellier broom, um, another one which is extremely uh, problematic in bushland settings is English broom. Uh, then you've got flax leaf broom as well. Um, now these, I mean, uh, uh, it is 
sort of generally thought that a, a plant like English broom, not this one, can actually have a seed viability in the soil for up to 80 years. So very important when you're dealing with these kind of species that you provide competition for them, not just bare ground. And you will get continual flushes of seedlings over time. But we do a lot of work on this sort of hand removal, um, cut and paint. Um, you can with small seedlings and dense regrowth or dense infestations also use chemical control. So herbicide application is a um, is another option as well. Um, a little bit more, a few more woody weeds. We're talking about um, red cestrum, which the spine bills love. We've done a hell of a lot of work on this in bushland settings, flowering at the moment. Um, here you've got, um, obviously they love the nectar from the flowers. Again, you find it in moist wet uh, areas, gullies, damp areas of the garden. Um, you can grub it out, uh, flowering this sort of time of year, late autumn through the winter. Um, uh, quite a smelly plant, can be a bit of an irritant, is quite toxic. Um, you've got to be careful get, to get a lot of the roots out of the ground or we do use cut and paint and even uh, drill and stem inject uh, herbicide into root systems of these plants. Um, spraying hasn't always been that successful, but yeah, again, like most weeds, you can do just about anything by hand. Comes down to time, resources, and um, I suppose the size and scale of the problem um, from, a, from, a, from a, a handwork perspective. But there we've got red testrum, um, closely related, uh, Toxic plant. Um, so Solanum mauritianum, this is tree tobacco, um, gets sort of, so related to a tomato and a potato, quite stinky, the hairs on the stems, um, you can see, hopefully, maybe not, um, uh, certainly an irritant, the berries if eaten, you have to treat as uh, potentially fatal. So it's flowering, but these will form um, yellow berries. So a toxic plant, but a very, very widely dispersed plant becoming, uh, can certainly uh, grow to four or five meters and beyond becoming a small tree, um, regenerates readily, uh, certainly can be removed by hand um, at a smaller stage, but just be mindful that it is a toxic plant um, and it does, the berries are highly poisonous and the, the fibers from the plant can be quite a skin irritant. So yeah, that, that is a, certainly an opportunistic plant, uh, a colonizer, and we, it, particularly in the damper areas, um, can be really, really problematic. Uh, where are we now? A couple more. Um, garden variety plants. God, I've, these seeds have gone everywhere. Couldn't get a good example of this because it's finished flowering. Agapanthus. Now, I don't know, with Agapanthus, it's, um, they're good and bad. Um, the thing you want to, they're very good at erosion control as, I'll, uh, as a photo that, I've, um, that I'll show you later will um, attest to. What you've got to try and stop with your agapanthus, particularly early on is again, we talked about stopping things from seeding. So with this particular plant, you want to stop it creating these seed pods, which then got these black seeds. Hopefully you can see those. That, that seed's viable, that seed will spread, wash off in water, get blown off, um, recolonize other areas. So I know Yarra Rangers Council have got a program, I think they call it off with their heads. Um, so we wanna try and deadhead our Aggies before they get to this stage. Um, so once they've finished flowering, you start to see these little seed pods forming, really good time to take the Agapanthus flowers off. They do spread vegetatively, so they will get bigger and larger and difficult to tackle. But um, I don't know, I do tend to put them further down the scale in terms of environmental weeds impacting intact areas of the bush. Um, as long as we're removing the, the seed source, which is the flowering part. In the garden, you can grub them out. Obviously, some of them are huge. Some of them even need excavators that are that big. But um, again, as you take them out, replace them with other vegetation, and they can provide sort of erosion control in certain settings, as I said, which I'll, I'll quickly show you a photo later on. Um, last weed I guess I'll show you for today, which, I, which is um, highly problematic, particularly in the Dandongs well, and well beyond, um, is wandering trad. So Tradescantia fluminensis. And this particular plant um, doesn't produce seed 
in Australia, but can grow from the smallest of fragments. Um, this bit was from my garden. So I've got it in my garden too. I've been battling it here now for 10, 12 years. So fragments like that absolutely will grow. Even very small leaf fragments like that, it will grow. Um, it, as I said, doesn't set seed, but because it's such a soft, fleshy plant, you can snap off, wash down in gutters, um, your dis disturbance in the garden gets raked around, recolonizes areas. A lot of people use chooks, uh, say chook do a great job of um, keeping it at bay. They actually do. They do stop it from um, growing densely, but they also do scatter it. So if chooks are taken off that particular area, you'll notice that the wandering trad might go out pretty bonkers. Um, goats as well are often used for many of these plants. Uh, you can hand weed this out. Um, it, it, um, it's invaded, I believe, something up to about 50 kilometers of stream side. Um, and uh, creek line throughout the Dandenongs. It's a very problematic gr weed, grows really fast. Um, if left unattended, you turn your back on it and all of a sudden it's covering half your garden. But you can hand weed it, you can roll it like a carpet. You've just got to be extremely thorough. Um, again, work on good areas out um, and just take your time with it. Um, no problems putting chooks on it if you just want to uh, decrease its uh, density. But on large infestations, we do, um, we do use chemical control with this. Um, there is also, it's also important to note that um, much research has been done for people like Mombolt Blancare, um, Bill Inkle, Bill, I'm not sure if you're with us today, um, but there has also been a uh, biological control agent release and trials are being uh, undertaken at the moment, uh, looking at uh, ways in which biological controls in the terms of funguses, for example, may be able to help us uh, manage and contain the spread of this plant. Um, so yeah, uh, I suppose one plant I haven't discussed right right now is um, blackberry. I think we've all dealt with blackberry. Tastes delicious, forms, forms dense thickets. Um, lots of people keeping bees these days. The bees themselves love the flowers, which so in, treating it from a chemical control perspective is, is obviously an issue at times. Um, obviously can, Cause, cause huge, uh, displace a lot of other vegetation. Um, uh, you can manage it through slashing it and keeping the canes down. You can put goats on it. You can um, grub out uh, grub out the corms, but you've got to get the whole root system out. Um, herbicide application through spraying is, is very effective if done properly and thoroughly um, at the right time when the plants aren't stressed. Um, so obviously blackberry is a is a is as, as a long-term key problem. Some of these plants are obviously um, weeds of national significance. There are blackberry management plans in place around the around the country, um, and um, yeah, difficult one to tackle. Um, but they do taste good. Yeah. Uh, another area which we won't really touch on now, but um, is the area of exotic grasses because that's a whole different ball game. Exotic grasses are some of the most um, resource intensive, but at the same time can be some of the most rewarding um, uh, plants to sort of work with, tackle and treat. So in the Yarra Ranges, we often are struggling with uh, plant, uh, grasses like sweet vernal grass, which is a, which was uh, mixed in with pasture grasses, such as, such as Coxford and, and Ryan clover. Um, large quaking grass, um, both of these are from Mediterranean, Eurasia, North Africa areas. Um, and then when you get out into the grasslands and probably less dominant um, in the Yarra Ranges, but certainly a weed which is problematic and is starting to increase in, in um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sightings of these plants are starting to increase in the Yarra Ranges. Serrated tussock, so, and Chilean needlegrass. Um, serrated tussock particularly as a is a plant which um, has a an amazing capacity to, to displace native grassland species um, uh, and is becoming a little bit more sort of um, prevalent in the Yarra Ranges. Doesn't like the wet deeper soils that we have over this side of town as much as it does in the grassland zone. So, but exotic grasses and treating exotic grasses is something we do a hell of a lot of. But uh, yeah, it's a whole, whole different ball game, very resource intensive. Um, 
and uh, yeah, you're definitely in for the long game when you're dealing with exotic grasses. Probably what I should do now is I'm just going to flick over um, to a different screen and just share some photos of some of the different techniques that we've used when we've been working in bushland settings. Um, and I've got a range of photos also looking at even areas in my own garden just to just to show you. No, I don't want that one. Don't want to see that. Just to show you some of the other things that um, even I'm dealing with on my own property and continue to deal with. So here you've got a couple of um, examples of drill and fill. Uh, this one, uh, one of these is on, uh, the one on the left is, um, is a holly infestation. So here you can see we've used uh, our drill, 10 mil drill bit, and you can see what's called a Valpar spot gun, which injects then um, herbicide into that drill hole, which has been placed in the tree. Um, both these sort of examples, drill holes are about uh, probably 30, 30 millimeters apart, the center, so they're quite close. Some tree species you can drill and fill much wider than that. Some you need to maybe go a little bit closer, depends what you're dealing with. You do have, uh, the drill holes are probably uh, 10 to 15 mil, uh, probably 15 mil deep. Again, that can vary on, on the tree species and the, the bark of the tree, what it is that you're actually um, treating. So the, the holly that you can see on the left-hand side, that actually had lots of suckers and runners uh, underneath it. We've cleaned the ground up around the holly, tracing it back, ripping it out, cutting and painting, getting back to the parent tree with a source of the infestation was, and then um, drilling and filling. So that's sort of drilling using the cordless drill and then injecting herbicide into the tree. Um, a very, very uh, common and popular technique used in bush regeneration, uh, where we can leave trees in the bush or in settings where they can be left standing. Um, obviously this is a, can be a difficult technique to use in areas where a large tree may fall and become a safety hazard. So that's something to consider. Uh, next image, where are we here? Here's a, here's a couple of examples of, um, hopefully you can see these. I'll just move this out of the way. Sorry about that. Um, here's a couple of examples. One example of ring barking. That's on a sallow wattle. So that was down, that was actually down in the northern western port end of town. So what we've done there is peeled a collar off the, um, using a saw, two cuts, um, top and bottom on the sallow wattle, use the secretaries to peel a ring and peel the bark off the, the tree. Um, that allows us to see, one, when we're moving through the bush, that that particular tree has been treated. And two, creating that sort of collar ensures that we, um, uh, know that we haven't left any bit of bark attached or there's any sort of thing in the um, in the sapwood of the tree still attached where the tree may still continue to grow. So it just allows you to be thorough and precise with your cuts. Um, the example on the right hand side is English ivy that's been treated on a mountain ash on a private property, a friend's property of mine. Um, now that was growing obviously from the ground up the tree. Um, we've cut that ivy about a meter above the ground. Now, the reason that we've done that, created a similar collar around the base of the tree, is to one, make sure that we've got every, every single runner, which is growing up the tree, um, it allows us then to trace back down to the ground, pull those runners back, grub the ivy out, maybe a bit of cut and paint. Um, but uh, by doing that, we ensure that every single runner that's run, go, heading up that tree can be treated. You can use this method on a whole range of different um, tree species, um, and there are variations on the technique. Uh, large, big, large runners growing up trees, we can use drill and fill and leave them intact, not cut them like this. Sometimes you need to scrape the edge, uh, the, scrape the runners, uh, maybe a 30 or 40 centimetre um, exposing 30 or 40 centimetres of the, the um, sap wood. So exposing that sap wood layer in the, in the runner of the ivy and then apply herbicide. Um, so this technique of cut and paint, the way that we've done it here on the tree, doesn't work very well on, uh, on tree ferns. So if you've got a tree fern which, which is heavily infested, you may find that you're better to leave all the runners in situ and use the technique where you scrape away bark on the, uh, uh, the, um, the bark and the outer layer of the ivy runner and then paint that runner, again, about 30, 40 centimeters, have to get every runner though. So slightly, slight different modifications 
on um, technique, depending on what plant plant um, or what, what, what the size of the infestation is and what plant it is that you're trying to protect. Um, here's an example of herbicide application. Again, this is a private property in Fernie Creek, another friend's property. Um, there you can see two of the team. Uh, we've done some prep work there prior to um, spraying to ensure that we didn't end up spraying desirable plants. But there we're um, on the left-hand side, that's us um, uh, spraying the wandering trad and a couple of months later and you can see from that that um, we're moving into moving into autumn by the color of the leaves on the deciduous plants that's the same location after herbicide application but you can see uh, you can see a little bit of angled onion coming up um, on that second photo so we've we've treated the trad but then what the the issue now is that we've prepped the ground for the angled onion to really take over so really important that we were able to get back or the the uh, friends of mine the property owners were able to get in there and start to tackle the angled onion so we didn't replace one problem with another they've also over time gone back through and just done a little bit of handwork, either with a coffee, a glass of wine, just removing little runners of um, wandering trad that may just be regenerating um, post the initial spray treatment. Um, here's a little example of sycamore maple removal by hand. This was actually up in um, Ferntree Gully, up near a thousand steps. Um, so we work in a particular area, dense, uh, I'd say, in previously a large sycamore maple had been removed, it was still quite a disturbed little spot, um, dense regeneration of sycamore maple seedlings. And what we've done there is just remove them by hand. Tried to stockpile them off the ground because even sycamores can reshoot and grow when they've, um, if left lying on the ground and it's got wet moist conditions. So before and after, again, handwork had sections of my garden which looked very similar to that and I go back every year and do the same process. Um, here's an example, a particular technique we use on something that I didn't bring up in terms of weeds, this is pampas grass, um, but we've um, started using a technique where we actually chainsaw through the, uh, the actual plant. You can spray them, um, but it's one messy process. Um, you can do, you do this technique even with a handsaw, but we do use the chainsaws, even though they don't actually like it. But this was a particularly large pampas grass. We cut the plant back, remove the material, get it back down to its base, and then we can paint those, um, uh, paint those stems of the plant. We either use a dabber bottle, sorry, apologies, got to show you that, I will do, or we um, we use a, a, a small spray bottle to ensure we get good coverage on those stumps, uh, uh, cut stems, sorry. Um, here's an example of hand weeding, apologies for them not being the greatest of photos, but this um, yellow plant, uh, yellow flower that you can see here is actually called a bulbine lily, a native lily. Beautiful lily, dies back and becomes dormant in the warmer months. And the it, heavy infestation of angled onion. So plant on the left, you can see just sticking up through that angled onion, hand weeding has been done around this um, colony of uh, bulbine lilies. Now on the right hand side, a lot of the green that you can see on the, on the ground are actually the leaves of the bulbine lilies that were growing in amongst the angled onion. Um, now, the next photo I'll show, not exa exactly the same shot, but it is in the same location. Poor photo, but there you can see an area in full flower once the angled onion's been hand weeded out of that particular location. So that's that, that was a great result, and we've had the opportunity to go back and follow that up. Had we used chemical control, we would have knocked out all of the bulbine lily. Had we used um, slashing and mowing in that particular area, we would have not allowed the bulbine lily to... Um, to flower and set seed. So an example of hand weeding on angled onion in amongst really nice native ground story vegetation. Um, here's an example of a roundabout in Belgrave Heights with a very heavy infestation of English broom. Um, there were lots of orchids, lots of native grasses like kangaroo grass adjoining a private property there. Um, so again, we were using hand weeding and grubbing out and cutting paint techniques. So techniques that are widely used in the field that you can easily use in your garden. Um, there's an example of the same site. Once we've finished removal of that broom, um, taking it off, 
uh, site, taken off location. You're left with um, native ground story vegetation, but we do have to continually go back and follow that site up because the English broom does regenerate. So always trying to tip it in favor of the native plants. Um, here's an example, it's a bit difficult to see, and I know I'm running out of time. Um, this is actually a large, uh, a photo I just took this morning went for, went for a bit of a walk. Um, in the middle of that photo is a larger sycamore maple that's been cut down with a chainsaw. Now you can probably see, I don't know if you can see the arrow that I'm moving around. Um, you can probably see that, that cut stump just there. And then because it hasn't been treated, um, that is treated with herbicide, um, what's happened is all of these other shoots and stems have shot out from the base. That now becomes a very difficult problem um, to tackle. You've got to go through cut and paint and treat all these stumps, maybe chainsaw that stump again and paint it, maybe put some um, drill holes into the stump to try and, try and treat it. So it's always best wherever possible to um, do the treatment first, then removal later. Otherwise you can be left with a problem that's worse than what you had in the beginning. Okay, let's have a little look at my back garden. There you can see the gate and the fence line. We're talking about edge effect and reinfestation of weeds. And my garden is by no means perfect. Um, these are sycamore, that's a sycamore maple and uh, top right, that's a sycamore maple. They're outside my garden. This is roadside batter. They seed back into my yard on the other side of the gate and I'm continually pulling them out. That's a yearly process, but it's what I need to do to ensure that sycamores don't take over my property. You can see that I've been working on the wandering trad on the left side of the photo and the um, neighboring property where there's wandering trad moving up the roadside. Obviously I'll be helping my neighbor with that um, over time, but that's that edge effect. And it is still continually creeping back onto my block. So I'm con constantly pushing it back. I do do a lot of handwork on that, but I also admittedly do use um, spray application to try and keep it under control. Um, that's the other side of the fence on my block, which was also completely covered in wandering trad. Um, and I'm slowly revegetating with native species. Um, we've got blanket leaf, mother shield ferns, cinnamon wattle. Uh, I've relocated some ferns out of the garden that were in um, uh, less than desirable spots, getting a lot of um, uh, heat burn in summertime. Um, I've also got Victoria Christmas bush and that entire area was covered in wandering track. Again, most of that has been treated with the hand removal over you know, a, a 10 year period with slow and steady progress. So back to my grandpa's a little bit and often. Um, there's another little area of my garden you can see where I've made some progress. Um, the, the top of the photo that you can see there, I've started to plant some tube stock back in, hazel pomodiris, um, austral mulberry, muttonwoods. That whole area was wandering trad and ivy and I've made it so that far down that side of the garden at this stage, wandering trad's got going again a little bit on my fence line. So my aim will be to continue to push this back down the garden and continue planting. Um, there's the front of my property. So you can see I've got a gravel road. Um, if I was to remove those agapanthus, that roadside would be destabilized. I'm on the low side of the road. It would um, potentially cause flooding, cause the house to flood. So they're providing erosion control. Well, all I do really with those agapanthus is every year, make sure I, I get those um, flower heads off before they set seed. Um, just on the other side of the fence, again, this was wandering trad. Um, right through the front of the garden. I've been slow and steady there. This was all done by hand. And I'm slowly uh, revegetating there with a range of different native species. Um, Create with the, one of my favorite plants, kangaroo grass is in there, which I've cut back um, to encourage some fresh growth for, for summer. I've got some hakeas and corias and lamandras in there, but again, slow and steady. So that's taken me to get to that stage, taken me 10 years. So. Yeah, really important to um, make sure that you just find those little wins in the garden. It can be a lot of fun. Hello, I'm back. Okay, um, Jen, I've talked for ages. Uh, I think that's a wrap for me. I think it's a really good time to take some questions. So um, where to from here?
Well, first of all, thank you so much, Roger. That was fantastic. I've, I've learned so much. You've also just made me feel really guilty about all the weeds in my garden. So I feel a bit inspired now to go out and do some this afternoon. You so thank say, you very you much for that. You, you, should, you shouldn't say that. We've all got a weedy garden. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But no, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you for putting all that effort in. We have had so many questions, so I'm going to do my best to get through as many as I can. But like I say, there are a lot. So we'll just kind of uh, pick out the ones that I think cover some good questions. So the first one we've got is from Nikki, and she wants to know, what's the best way to dispose of weeds once they've been pulled out? If they're put in the rubbish bin, does that just relocate the weeds? Um... Uh, I've got a um, Yarra Rangers, um, you know, just council green bin. Um, am I am I right to stay like this, Jen, or do you want me to go yeah, full screen? No, yeah. you're all good like that. Yeah. Okay, cool, great. Um, uh, we've got a rule of thumb that it, in our household, it's absolutely illegal to put that green bin out empty. So I'll, it'll be like Thursday night, the bin's going to get collected. It's nearly dark and I go, oh no, I've got half a bin left. So I'm ripping out whatever weeds I can. So using your green bins are really, really good. Um, a uh, really, really good option. Um, in the garden, depending on what weed species you're treating, you can just elevate them, um, hang them in other trees. Um, you can, there's green waste um, drop off points, it tips. Um, it, obviously it costs money to do that, but I do know Yarra yeah, Rangers offer vouchers for certain env environmental weeds where you can get tip vouchers um, for tray loads. Even I've taken advantage of that. Um, there are also, council um periodic council weed drop off um uh programs so we spoke about the agapanthus off with their heads occasionally there are um skips left at certain locations where you can drop off your environmental weeds um so yeah you, you are right you i mean you certainly don't want to go and drop them on on the roadside which is obviously a very big problematic issue we often see a lot of dumped green waste on uh, roadside areas adjoining bushland. And that is often the source of many of the infestations that we end up dealing with in the bush. So yeah, disposal is um, uh, varied and numerous in terms, of, in terms of options. I hope that answers that, Jen. Yeah, I think so, I think that was good. Um, we've yeah. got a few questions. People wanted to know what herbicide uh, do you use? What herbicide rate do you use for cut and paste and drill and fill? And yeah, what sort of, for, for wandering trad and holly there's a few kind of questions but basically yeah wanting to know what sort of herbicide you use yeah sure sure um there's um uh there is a whole range of different herbicides which are used and then unfortunately um it's kind of uh kind of a strange uh thing and it's often with bush regen can be a bit of an ethical compromise using some of these products you might go shop and buy organic veggies and there you are caught using monsanto products to um and what's perceived as spraying you know chemical into the bush so it can be difficult at times um the um uh, in terms of drill and fill cut and paint um techniques the the go-to chemical is one that's obviously getting a lot of press at the moment and that is glyphosate um uh when we're using dabber bottles and apologies i didn't show a dabber bottle i haven't got my gloves in, um so I'll, um, you can see um in my pouch there's a little like a shoe polish bottle got a separate container in there got a sponge on the end um that can be used to apply chemical to a pot. um so glyphosate is like widely used uh, nine times out of ten, it's used neat um, in spot guns or or you know uh, stem injection guns that we use, um, and also dabber bottles. Um, there are times where it's also used at a 50-50 ratio, depending on what plant you're treating. So, at the moment, when we were treating, I showed that photo of the pampas grass. We're using a a small spray applicator bottle, um, which uh, we've got a 50-50 mix to make sure that we get good coverage over the the cut stumps. And you can experiment with many different ways in between, uh, many different options between that. Um, Wandering trad, uh, we is a chemical called Styrane Advanced. That's pretty much the only chemical that you'll use on it um, that can treat it. Some of these chemicals are, um, you know, you want to be very careful about the protective equipment that you're wearing. It is important to make sure that you take care of not only the health of the environment, but that your own health. So when we're uh, spraying, as you could see in one of the photos, we've got um, coveralls on, gumboots, uh, long appropriate, your gloves, safety goggles, hats, respirators. 
these are things to consider. Um, a lot of these chemi chemicals you can't buy from regular hardware stores and retail outlets. You might need to go to agricultural chemical supply places. Um, and you just need to be confident in your ability to use them. So sometimes a little bit of specialist advice um, or help from, from bushland contractors might be worth considering. Um, yeah, but Starain particularly for, for um, wandering trad. Um, there's a whole host of other chemicals, Garlon 600, um, Brush Off, which is a granular chemical, which you do have to be very careful with around um, plants such as ferns, because it has a long, uh, a long um, active life in soil and is highly mobile, particularly in sandy soils. Um, uh, Camberem to treat other um, herbaceous weeds, um, Basta, which is a change up chemical or contact herbicide, which we use for um, sometimes instead of glyphosate in more sensitive areas. There are also a range of organic listed herbicides, um, which are based on pine oil or derivatives from geraniums, um, such as uh, bioweed control and slasher. I've had done some really interesting trials with both of those, but they are still chemicals and they can still cause cause harm. So um, yeah, you just got to be um, very respectful and uh, thorough and conscious of the, uh, I suppose the the um, implications of using herbicides. Absolutely. And I'll say as well that if anyone does want to get a Dabba bottle, we uh, do give them away at any of the Yarra Rangers community links. So Mombok, Healesville, Yarra Junction, Upway, Lilydale. Um, obviously, those are most of those are closed during lockdown, but once lockdown's over, you can just walk in and get a Dabba bottle. And obviously, just be really careful and follow the instructions on any label on the label of any product you're using. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Don't forget your PPE. Just good pairs of gloves and a pair of safety uh, glasses um, go a long way. Just um, just respect it like you would any other product and chemical. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Roger. Um, another question from Mel, who wants to know um, if you do use a spray treatment on a ground cover, how long until you could replant native ground covers after a spray? Yeah, that's a very good question. It depends on the chemical, actually. Um, like they have um, different what's called withholding periods. A lot of that actually relates to um, uh, agricultural settings though, about when you can put stock back onto land. Um, but um, actually with many of them quite quickly. Um, so um, uh, obviously you need to wait for the chemical to take effect and then for those particular plants to die back when it gets to that sort of stage you're probably good to go with most chemicals which don't provide residual control in the soil um, and that is for long periods of time now i mentioned a chemical like brush off which is a broadly selective chemical which we do use sparingly in certain certain locations um, to, to control certain difficult to, to, to control weeds. Um, not something we use a lot in very sensitive areas. And as I said, certainly not around ferns. Um, that would, you would leave a little longer. There's no time frame that you can really give. It depends on soil type, location, um, moisture, so many different factors. But I think once you're seeing that weed die back, um, and, and sort of dissipate, um, that's, a, that's a perfectly good time to start to plant. So, you know, if you sprayed an area with glyphosate, you'd certainly be able to put plants back in there within the month. Excellent. And talking of uh, replacement species and planting, but a couple of questions for people wanting to know, um, if, once you've removed large amounts of trad or panic belt grass or ivy on the ground, what are good suggestions, uh, good suggestions for nat native replacements? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, again, depends on the, the location, but what I what I tend to try and do, um, and something we do when we're in the bushes, let's say you, um, panic belt grass is a classic example and a very problematic weed, um, not one that I really went, had time to go over today, certainly one we spend a lot of time on. But if you've got a large infestation or an area of panic belt grass that you treat and you hand weed and remove, it's likely that it is going to come back. Um, because, uh, because of the sheer amount of seed that it produces. So maybe consider in that particular location, not planting grasses. So you might look at planting, um, you know, lilies such as um, flax lilies, so dianellas or lamandras or even certain types of shrubs. So if you did want to actually use various different control techniques, whether it be 
hand weeding, um, careful herbicide application. If you've got a larger area, you can still keep those options open. Um, just the same if you're removing wandering trad, um, highly likely that you will get some regrowth. So early on, you might consider species which are going to be um, resilient and not affected if you did go back in with 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 herbicide application, for example. So um, yeah, again, dianellas or ferns. Um, if you're taking trad out of damp areas, mother shield ferns, mother shield ferns are just absolutely amazing. They're just one of the most remarkable plants, certainly one of my favorites um, in the forested sections. Once you think you've got it under control, um, you get often when you remove wandering trad, you get a lot of forest hound's tongue, which is, looks very similar, but is a native plant species. Um, has a has a sort of like a prickly, hairy, furry, sort of, um, not furry, prickly texture to it, a bit like a cat's tongue. Um, that often comes up in droves when you've been treating wandering trad. Um, so yeah, trying to encourage that to grow um, or even planting that if you think you've got it under control. And cool. those sort of plants are readily available at uh, indigenous nurseries. Excellent, thanks Rog. And talking on the trad, someone, uh, Gabriel has said that they've uh, had someone burn a, a test area of trad using a gas burner and so far it hasn't come back. Do you use this method? Um, don't use gas burners um, as such because um, uh, with using, sorry, that's just my dog's barking. Um, um, with using um, gas burners, quite in quite um, resource intensive, um, takes a long time and for large areas, probably too slow, which is why we would use um, chemical control. I do probably feel that you could probably hand weed or rake out areas just as quickly. And the gas burner itself has its own environmental issues. So, I mean... You know, you often find frogs in among wandering trad, um, just like with either gas burners or even steam, um, which has been, we've done trials on in the past, you know, those things can have their impacts on um, native fauna too, and also stored seed and, uh, and native vegetation. Um, but if it's worked for you, great. Um, and if it's working in your garden setting, then stick with it. At least, it, you know, it's a uh, certainly a, a, another option and a, and a good option um to use a, apart from chemical control so yeah i don't think I, I don't think there's always any hard and fast rules you often see people have really interesting experiences with things that maybe you've had less success with and and you learn from those experiences i'm learning every day from other people about um the successes and challenges they've had with weed control cool yeah it's it's a it's a ever ever evolving uh, program i think uh, absolutely absolutely yeah We've had a couple of questions from uh, Carl and Karen about agapanthers. Um, so yeah. Carl wanted to know, say that uh, grubbing out a massive root ball is not exactly practical. Are there any other measures he could take to kill or remove them? And Karen has talked about uh, that she has new, a very large problem with them taking over her natural bush block. It's too big to tackle manually. Any suggestions? Yeah, um, agapanthers, um, yeah, agapanthus aren't don't actually appear on any chemical label. Um, so um, when you tr if you're spraying agapanthus, um, um, you are um, uh, um, yeah, it is it is it is a difficult problem, and they are very 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 difficult to kill. Now. Um, Grubbing out is a technique that we use a lot, even for large plants. Um, um, and on a, a large broad scale problem in a bushland setting, again, just trying to ensure that they don't flower um, and set seed is the is um, step number one. Um, there's a whole range of things. People have tried cut and paint on them. Um, we actually have tried cut and paint. If I remember rightly, um, they are possibly even on label um, for a chemical called Vigilant. Um, and Vigilant, you can buy in a dabber bottle. It's a gel-like um, solution. Um, it is a little bit difficult and messy to use and we've had variable results with it. Um, uh, but um, you can get that from agricultural um, suppliers like uh, E. Muir's in Mombok, for example. Um, that can have good effect. I've had people um, uh, suggest they've had some really interesting results with cutting the plant back um, low to the base and then putting scores into the roots and the, and the, and the cut crowns of the plants, um, just letting more water into the plant. They get a bit mushy and um, 
whether or not that can actually drown the plant out, I do think that's something that's, um, I did try that on uh, one, uh, one actual agapanthus at home to limited effect. Um, but again, it's probably something you've got to do regularly. It's not something that will be a one hit wonder on treating an agapanthus. Um, when it comes to spraying them, you can spray it, but you generally need to use chemicals, which it would be off label. So whether or not it's permitted use, um, depending on the scale, it may be a situation where you consider applying for a permit to use that chemical um, off label. Um, and it also depends on what vegetation you've got around because that, that herbicide application could adversely affect the surrounding bushland. So they are a difficult one from a chemical control method. Yeah, they're pretty tricky. They're, they're big, big things to try and get rid of in your garden. I know that from <laughs> personal experience. Uh, ab absolutely. At times it can be a job for an excavator. <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, we've yeah. got a couple of questions about ivy. So uh, Joe wants to know, do we need to worry about the wind sail effect of dead ivy up in gums after it has died off? Is there a best time to kill ivy in gums? And someone else wants to know, uh, what can you do with the ivy runners going up a tall tree? Do you remove them or will they fall off eventually? Oh, okay. So um, I think, um, I hope I've got this right, wind sail effect. So we're talking about it sort of catching the wind and possibly causing um, a problem where the tree might sort of topple over. Would that be, is that what you're thinking there, Jeff? I think so, yeah. I think that's what the question yeah. refers to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. I think that's, I think that's, um, the, I think that's a legitimate question for sure. And actually one of my concerns with ivy growing up trees um, has, has also been particularly with compromised trees is that um, possibly that ivy might be one of the factors that's also holding that tree up which makes it very, very complicated, um, particularly if you're dealing with a tree that looks unhealthy, might be close to a house or close to a roadside, close to power lines. Um, in, in terms of um, the runners up the tree themselves, they will die back over time. Um, so you don't need, I mean, some of those runners can be 30, 40 meters up a tree. So that's where it's really important to treat each runner and why we create that, that collared section at the bottom of the, um, tree to make sure we've treated every single one of those runners. Um, same scenario on a fern, for example. So um, yeah, at the base of the tree, pulling them back and grubbing them out, making sure you elevate them so they're not on the ground, putting them in the green waste bin, or obviously um, a, an option at the, uh, at the right time of year is even when they're dried out, you know, sort of um, uh, burning off uh, if you have that option to, to burn off in your backyard, obviously making sure you register your burn. So yes, um, ivy can pose problems from a wind perspective, from the health of the tree. Can trees topple over once you've removed the ivy? Um, that could be a problem. Um, uh, can the ivy on the tree that's not treated cause the tree to topple over because of wind and increased borer attack and rotting out the base? Yes, it can do that. So yeah, I don't think there's any 100% right answer there, but um, yeah, make a very, very good educated sort of assessment of the situation. And um, uh, uh, I suppose with that, with that uh, uh, educated assessment, make, make an informed decision about what you will do in that, in that particular case. That sounds like good advice. I like that. Uh, mm. Fiona has a question about clover. They've got lots in their garden and it keeps going through, even through the mulch. Is it bad? Is it good? How to get rid of it if it is bad? Um, I suppose it depends if it's bothering you or if it's growing in amongst your native uh, garden beds or even any garden bed, um, you can grub it out. Um, it was a very, very common um, uh, plant that was in rye and clover mix that was sown for lawns and horse fodder. So yeah, um, um, it, it can be a nuisance weed um, and there's many weeds, even in my garden, I think of uh, flick weed and uh, uh, um, winter grass and I get clover growing in, in the lawn area. I've actually got a lawn area which I'm trying to encourage to grow um, a fairly um, uh, solid ground cover of uh, weeping grass, the native weeping grass or microlina stipoides. So yeah, probably a nuisance weed. Um, you could do small scale spraying of it, um, but it's um, usually in disturbed revegetated areas um not really dealt with it so much on a very very high level uh problematic invasive environmental weed but yeah if it's bugging you absolutely hand weeding's a, 
a really good technique. Again, with hand weeding knives, plow, um, any of these sort of little little devices, um, they're great for it. Yeah, and uh, once again, stopping it from setting seed. So don't let it flower and set seed. Excellent. And we've had a couple of questions from Kate and Audrey on some uh, weeds you haven't mentioned. So uh, they're interested in how to tackle oxalis, bridal creeper, and ragwort. Um, actually, two of those, two of those were on my list, and I realised I was running out of time, so I, I actually skipped over bridal. Let's talk about bridal creeper first, because that was on my list, and I'll include in bridal creeper asparagus fern, its close relative. So bridal creeper, um, obviously a weed of na national significance, um, does tend to like the slightly drier sites. Um, in the wetter environments, you'll end up with asparagus fern, which is very problematic. Um, they can, they grow, um, they die back uh, in the in the in the warmer months. So bridal creeper and asparagus fern are getting really busy and are up about at the moment. Um, bridal creeper is on label for brush off. Um, so if you wanted to spray it, um, you can use brush off. That's at, I think it's at half a gram and you've got to use a surfactant like BS 1000. So that's one of the control techniques. Again, when it's growing vigorously, before it flowers and sets seed, avoiding really, really cold times of the day. So um, sunny times and when obviously when it's not gonna uh, rain for a period of time, uh, brush off four hours before it's uh, rain fast. Um, you can grub out bridal creeper and asparagus fern. You just need to get the crown out. So um, bridal creeper and asparagus, uh, bridal creeper particularly can form massive dense mats um, of tubers, which are spent tubers, which can take up like a metre squared. Um, all you really need is like the fistful crown of the plant. So where it's coming out of the ground, you take that um, crown out of the the ground, elevate it, or particularly dispose of it offside if possible, um, uh, and that's really, really effective. So again, we've been we've been doing quite a lot of this recently, actually, using our picks, just grubbing out around the crown and getting them out the ground, elevating them if we're a long way off off track or areas where we can't dispose of them in green waste bins or um, disposal facil facilities. Um, that's a really good technique. Uh, we use that for both of those plants. Um, Oxalis, particularly Oxalis incarnata, pale wood sorrel is a really, really difficult weed to treat. Again, you can use brush off on that. Um, you can use glyphosate on, glyphosate on that from a spray point of view. You can dig it out, but they've got many little woody tubers um, and bulbils. They will split, break off and spread. Very, very difficult weed to tackle. It grows in the wet, cold, damp months. So it, it, yeah, really problematic if you're trying to do some effective, uh, excuse me, chemical control. And it is also growing very often through desirable vegetation, which eliminates some of that opportunity to use chemical control. So a lot of the work we do on oxalis is generally quite small scale um, and does involve hand removal techniques. Cool, oh, thanks for that. That was a really quick, uh, good, quick, quick uh, summary. I liked it. Um, <laughs> we just got a couple more, uh, one more minute, for a couple more questions. So Nikki just wants to know: Can you just please name the tool that you use to inject the herbicide? As she didn't know. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, sure, it's called a Velpar spot gun. <laughs> Uh, apologies, I've realised I left um, both of them on the other work vehicles. Um, but um, it's uh, it, yeah, a bottle hose connected, um, and then it's got like a, a pistol sort of um, trigger that injects herbicide into the drill hole. Um, oh, you can actually use a whole range of different things. Um, to be honest, um, we carry as an emergency, you can get sort of um, particular uh, bottles with little nozzles like oil fill bottles, or even um, even in a case of emergency, you can even use things like a, a Master Foods sauce bottle. So the, the classic plastic bottle with a little twist lid, just make sure you don't take the wrong bottle to the, um, to the barbecue. If you have put glyphosate in that, make sure you mark your bottle accordingly, uh, only put in as much as you need to use. They are also a little bit messier than the Valpar spot guns. So um, again, agricultural chemical supply places and farm chemical supply places, they're about $180. Um, but um, yeah, really good piece of kit that we use a hell of a lot. Excellent. And I've just got, there's a couple of questions I'm just going to quickly answer because David wanted to know about the trad smut um, and if it's available for distribution yet. We were, obviously, we were talking about the biochemical control 
for yeah, TRAD. Yeah. Um, I will just say that CSIRO, who are the people who are working with that, unfortunately, not only did they have COVID last year, but they also had a large hailstorm on their uh, lab, um, which did actually smash through a bit of their greenhouse area. So they have been put back quite a lot by that, but they will uh, be hopefully be able to distri distribute more as, uh, as they get that fixed. It was a bit of a disastrous year last year for them. And Robin had a quick question as well about um, neighbours who had uh, agapanthus and other pro problems on their property. I will say she wants to know if they can get any assistance. Do contact council. We can assist a little bit with that. There's only so much we're able to do, but we can help uh, get in touch with that neighbour and at least alert them to the issue that they've got. Um, so it doesn't guarantee that they will listen to us, but we will do our best. <laughs> Um, and the very last question, I'll just wrap up with this one. Jeanette wanted to know, what's a good resource for identifying weeds and or any kind of lookalikes to weeds as well? Um, that one for me, is it, Jen? Yeah, um, that's for you. <laughs> yep. Um, actually, well, yeah, rangers have a fantastic um, weed, uh, weed guide and weed brochure. So I think downloading anything that's available, publications from Yarra Rangers or at the community links, um, I think they're a really good start, actually. Um, so the brochure for both uh, native and indigenous plants and also um, that particular weed brochure is great. There is a really good book by Richardson and Richardson, Weeds of the Southeast. Um, which is a publication which is available through uh, CSIRO Bookshop. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend that. Um, there are other sort of um, uh, uh, sources as well. You can go to um, uh, Flora Victoria, which does co cover all of the flora and the bot uh, botany within Victoria. Um, so that's quite a a bit of a scientific specific site and you might need to punch in have a little bit of detail about what it is that you're looking for but that's run by uh, out of the royal botanic gardens i think if I remember right, like vic flora um so that's a website to look up but um weeds of the southeast is a fantastic uh book we keep it in all our work vehicles and uh, yeah I, I think castle themselves are a really good source of information yeah um with native plants one last thing Flora of Melbourne. So fantastic publication available from a wide range of bookstores. Um, and yeah, really good book that um, highlights many of the key uh, attributes of local indigenous plants. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roger. This has been really, really informative. I really appreciate your time this morning and all the work you've obviously done beforehand, getting all your plants and things out of the garden. Um, so thank you. I hope you've They weren't all out of my garden, Jen. <laughs> I'm sure it's not all yours. <laughs> but thank you so much. I've got I most of them though. <laughs> we do really, yeah, it's been really fantastic though. And uh, yeah, I feel very inspired. So I am ready to go outside and do some weeding now. A uh, big thank you again, Roger, for joining us and giving up your Sunday morning for us. Oh, no problem at all. And um, like uh, any other questions that are still there, Jen, feel free to find them through. I'm more than happy to answer them. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and if ever there's any other information that comes through that people are seeking advice on, yeah, we're we're totally open to helping people out because it is a it's a tough problem. It's a tough gig, you know. We're all trying to deal with it. So always happy to help people that try and do the right thing. Thank you so much. That's awesome. All right, Ellen, we'll let everyone go now and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Go out in your garden and pull some weeds. Yeah. <laughs>